A life of action is much easier to me than writing. I have greater facility for action than for writing. Writing is something you can never do as well as it can be done. It is a perpetual challenge, and it is more difficult than anything else that I have ever done. So I do it. I am trying to make, before I get through, a picture of the whole world, or as much of it as I have seen. Boiling it down, always, rather than spreading it out thin. has to make up stories for them to be rounded and not flat like photographs. But he makes them up out of what he knows. Through the other noise, I heard a cough. Then came the cha-cha-cha-cha. Then there was a flash, as when a blast furnace door is swung open and a roar that started white and went red and on and on in a rushing wind. I went out swiftly, all of myself, and I knew I was dead, and that it had all been a mistake to think you just died. Then I floated, and instead of going on, I felt myself slide back. I breathed, and I was back. Dear Mom and Dad, the wounds are coming on in rare shape. However, from present indications, I will never look well in kilts. The 227 wounds I got from the trench mortar didn't hurt a bit at the time. Only my feet felt like I had rubber boots full of water on. Hot water. My surgeon, Captain Samarelli, is always asking whether you, Dad, the great surgeon Hemingway of Chicago, will be entirely satisfied with the operations. He wants his work to be perfect. World War I was a very important experience to Hemingway. He signed up for the war. He knew this was going to be his experience. Something told him war is going to be really important to you. And he'd gotten close enough, as he said, to war to be able to use the experience. But he got away with his life. And he got away with material that he would use for the rest of his life. When Ernest came back from the war, he had a very elegant a uh, cape on and boots. He didn't look like himself at all. He looked like an Italian. A bunch of Italians came out from Chicago to our house and they brought all kinds of things to drink. We had never seen people drink liquor in our house before. So it was quite an occasion. I was just very glad he was home. When Hemingway came back, he was known in his town as a war hero. And I think for a time, he probably reveled in that kind of attention and adulation from uh, his younger sisters, from his family, from the people in the community. 
But I think that probably was really at odds with what he was feeling inside. Suppose you want to hear all about Hadley. Well, her nickname is Hash. She's a wonderful tennis player, best pianist I ever heard, and a sort of terribly fine article. Know how you feel about my being too young to be married. Felt exactly the same way until Hash. So, in circumstances like those, you have to make allowances. We lived in the Rue Notre-Dame-des-Champs, over a sawmill. There was a back door into a cellar, and that's where I had my piano. It was so cold in the winter, I played wearing several sweaters, while Ernest wrote or read manuscripts in a nearby cafe. We were very poor at times, but that story about Ernest wringing pigeons' necks in the Luxembourg gardens and hiding them in the baby carriage, that's Ernest's very inventive mind. Dear Sherwood, Hadley is out in the town now, and I've been earning our daily bread on this write machine. In a couple of days, we'll be settled, and then I'll send out your letters of introduction like launching a flock of ships. Dear Sherwood, lots of things happen here. Gertrude Stein and me are just like brothers, and we see a lot of her. I've been teaching Pound to box with little success. He has the general grace of the crayfish. I have to shadow box between rounds to get up a sweat. Pound sweats well, though, I will say that for him. Pound thinks I'm a swell poet. He also took a story for the little review. He's written a good review of Ulysses. Joyce has written a most goddamn wonderful book. When Hemingway went to Paris, he found himself surrounded by other people who were very self-consciously experimenting with language, with art. And Ezra Pound had said very famously to these young moderns, make it new. He spoke of wanting to get rid of what he called the emotional slither of 19th century prose. And that was a challenge that Hemingway took up. Hemingway was a young man who was determined he was going to be a great writer. And he was absorbing everything like a sponge. And yet he made it new in his own way. was defurnishing. He was stripping bare the English-American writing style of the 19th and early 20th century. He was leaving things out to pull people in. He was an experimental avant-garde writer, and because he, his style became the dominant one, we tend to forget that. He was a brave, new, avant-garde experimentalist. And what is he using that style on? The oldest American story of all, the boy sets out on life, on his adventures. And yet he made that story the, you know, the subject that went with this new style. And he did it in Paris. I was writing about up in Michigan. And since it was a wild, cold, blowing day, it was that sort of day in the story. 
I had already seen the end of fall come through boyhood, youth, and young manhood. And in one place, you could write about it better than in another. Maybe away from Paris, I could write about Paris, as in Paris, I could write about Michigan. Hemingway is always described as being simple. He's not simple. He simply uses rather pure colors. But the effects are not simple, never were. The simplicity has to evoke an emotion. Now, from the moment he was born, he was going to be a great writer. But how did he so quickly turn into uh, an absolute master of the short story? I guess you have to say that that's something that we will never understand, but we have to accept it. We have to accept that a, a, a caterpillar can turn into a butterfly. And it isn't a matter of training or anything else. It's just a phenomenon. It happens. And that's true of every major artist. They happen. Dear old Carper, Pamplona is a swell town of about 30,000 on a plateau in the middle of the mountains of Navarre. The greatest country you ever saw. The people have any people in the world skinned. Bulls racing loose through the streets every morning, dancing and fireworks all night. Everybody in town lit for a week. And us guys, practically the guests of the city. Of all the countries that he went to, the one that felt most comfortable was Spain. He really identified with the Spanish people. He liked their philosophy. He liked their whole attitude toward life. He liked the fact that their number one, at that time, that their number one passion was the bullfight. And he became hooked on this drama of a wild beast and a man and the whole tradition, hundreds of years old, it was almost a religious thing. I looked through the glasses and saw the three matadors. Romero was in the center, Belmonte on his left, Martial on his right. Romero was wearing a black suit. His tricornered hat was low down over his eyes. Pedro Romero took off his heavy gold brocaded cape and handed it over the fence to his sword handler. The sword handler took the cape, looked up at Brett, and came over to us. Spread it out in front of you, I said. The sword handler looked back, shook his head. Romero poured water over the percale of his fighting cape and then scuffed the lower folds in the sand with his slippered foot. What's that for? Brett asked. To give it weight in the wind. Hemingway always wanted a real market. He wanted bestseller dem, and he was not going to get that from short stories. Plus, there was the prestige angle. There was the great American novel. Had, heavens forbid, his good friend, of whom he was often jealous, F. Scott Fitzgerald, had he written the great American novel in Great Gatsby? Hemingway somewhere suspected that he had. Um, he was not about to let that challenge go by. So Hemingway, the competitor, couldn't be just short stories. He had to be the contender. <laughs> Pedro Romero had the greatness. He loved bullfighting, and I think he loved Brett. Everything of which he could control the locality, he did in front of her all that afternoon. Never once did he look up. He did it all for himself inside, and it strengthened him. And yet he did it for her, too. This is a novel about a lady. Her name is Lady Ashley, and when the story begins, she is living in Paris, and it is spring. That should be a good setting for a romantic but highly moral story. 
As everyone knows, Dear Ernest, Paris is a very I can't lovely. imagine how you could have done these first 20 pages of Sun Also Rises so casually. You can't play with people's attention. From page 30, I begin to like the novel, but Ernest, I can't tell you the sense of disappointment that beginning gave me. Please, do what you can about it. In Dear Mr. Perkins, I believe that I will start the book at what is now page 16 in the manuscript. There is nothing in those first 16 pages that does not come out. I think it will move much faster that way. Scott agrees with me. It has been apparent for some time that Ernest Hemingway is a writer of very unusual gifts. In The Sun Also Rises, he takes a decided step forward. A sense of unbounded vigor that characterized Ernest Hemingway's book of short stories in our time. He has learned something from Mr. Anderson and something perhaps from Mr. Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby. Written in terse, precise, and aggressively refreshing prose, and containing some of the finest dialogue yet written in this country. He is, in many respects, the most exciting of contemporary American writers of fiction. To say that his literary... Dear Ernest, I belong to a current book study class, and I could not face being present when your last book was reviewed. It is a doubtful honor to produce one of the filthiest books of the year. Surely you have other words in your vocabulary, besides damn and bitch. Every page fills me with sick loathing. I think Hemingway did very much care what his family thought of him, what other people thought. He was a maverick, but part of him was always that Midwestern boy from Oak Park, Illinois. Uh, Gertrude Stein said of him that he was 90% Rotarian. Uh, he, was, he was always, in some ways, um, middle class and his, his morality. When you have two people who love each other, are happy and gay, and really good work is being done, people are drawn to them, as surely as migrating birds are drawn at night to a powerful beacon. We had already been infiltrated by another, using the oldest trick there is. It is that an unmarried young woman becomes the temporary best friend of another young woman who is married, goes to live with the husband and wife, then innocently and unrelentingly sets out to marry the husband. When the husband is a writer, the husband has two attractive girls around when he has finished work. One is new and strange, and if he has bad luck, he gets to love them both. At first, when I knew he was in love with Pauline Pfeiffer, I felt alternative relief and rage. I told them they mustn't see each other for a hundred days, and at the end of that time, if they were still in love, I would divorce Ernest. My heart was not broken. I did love him in a way, more than ever, but as though he were a child. He was so complicated, so many sides to him, you could hardly make a sketch of him in a geometry book. When I got back to Paris, I should have caught the first train from the Gare de l'Est that would take me down to Austria. But the girl I was in love with was in Paris then, and I did not take the first train, or the second, or the third. When I saw my wife again, standing by the tracks as the train came in, I wished I had died before I loved anyone but her. That was the end of the first part of Paris. Paris was never to be the same again, although it was always Paris. And you changed as it changed. Mr. Hemingway, what is the best early training for a writer? An unhappy childhood. How can a writer train himself? Watch what happens today. If we get into a fish, see exactly what it is that everyone does. 
If you get a kick out of it while he's jumping, remember back until you see exactly what the action was that gave you the excitement. Whether it was the rising of the line from the water and the way it tightened like a fiddle string until drops started from it, or the way he smashed and threw water when he jumped. Remember what the noises were and what was said. Then write it down, making it clear so the reader will see it too and have the same feeling you had. That's a five-finger exercise. My father was a writer trying to get a, a start in the world, and he really broke through as a, a major presence in American writing with Farewell to Arms. Sun Also Rises was very successful, but Farewell to Arms, everybody heard about it and knew about it. And his publisher, Scribner's, put out all this PR stuff about him, how he was wounded on the Italian front, and more or less implied that the hero of Farewell to Arms was really Hemingway. And I think that was when he first realized that, you know, this was going to be done one way or another. That every work that he wrote was going to be interpreted as him doing it. And he said, well, if it's going to be done anyway, why not do it oneself and shape it in such a way that it did him the most good? And so he cultivated it as his own PR person. I have heard of him, both at various times and in one great bunch, that he is so hard-boiled he makes a daily practice of busting his aged mother in the nose, that he dictates his stories because he can't write, and has them read to him because he can't read, that no woman within half a mile of him is a safe woman, that he not only commands enormous prices for his short stories, but insists on taking the right eye out of the editor's face that he has been a tramp, a safe cracker, and a stockyard attendant, that he is the darling of the left bank, and may be found at any hour of the day or night, sitting at a little table at the select, rubbing absinthe into his gums. About all that remains to be said is that he is the lost Dauphin, that he was shot as a German spy, and that he is actually a woman masquerading in man's clothes. And those rumors are doubtless being started even as we sit here. The media got hold of Ernest with his gun, knocking off animals and hobnobbing with matadors and being a macho figure of the world. That really wasn't Ernest. In Farewell to Arms, Lieutenant Henry loses everything. He loses Catherine, he loses the child, he loses everything. He's lost his experience. They had to retreat from Caporetto. Where does he go? He walks back to the hotel in the rain at night. This is Ernest. This, this is not the swashbuck, a buckling, two-fisted giant that roams the world, knocking over guys in his way, seducing women, being with movie stars. That isn't Ernest Hemingway. That isn't, that isn't the poet. I'd come over from France on the boat when I was five. Papa and I were on the train on the way to Philadelphia when he got the telegram about his father, which I didn't see. He just told me that his father was dead and that he had to go. I was very sad that he didn't come with me. Later, my father did tell me about it, almost as if I was being let in on a great secret. He said his father shot himself. What was my grandfather like? I can't remember him except that he gave me an air rifle and an American flag when I came over from France that time. He's hard to describe. He was a great hunter and fisherman, and he had wonderful eyes. I'll bet he wasn't better than you. Oh, yes, he was. He shot very quickly and beautifully. I'd rather see him shoot than any man I ever knew. He was always very disappointed in the way I shot. Hemingway was the first writer that I really devoured. Wanted to read everything he had written. The basic thing he wrote about were in themselves attractive. First love, 
first thoughts of death, first relationship with parents, all those things were eternal. And I think the thing that really affected a great many would-be writers of my generation was he was a man of action. He was adventurous. He was not the guy with the glasses on who sits in a, in a room and types out his stuff. He was really a man involved in the world. And you mustn't forget that our generation lived under the shadow of encroaching fascism. This is a true face of men going into action. It is a little different from any other face that you will ever see. Men cannot act before the camera in the presence of death. I first met Hemingway in the Domago Cafe in Paris and asked him what he intended to do in Spain. He said, report the truth about it, that every war is bad. In Spain, he saw what was really happening and became an anti-fascist. He saw that most of his friends, war fighters, barmen, and others he knew before the war, were fighting on the Democratic, the Republican side, against Franco and the rebels. Bueno. Living in the cellars of that ruined building are the enemy. They are Moors and civil guards, professional soldiers, fighting against the people in arms, trying to impose the will of the military and the will of the people. And the people hate them. For, without their tenacity and the constant aid of Italy and Germany, the Spanish revolt would have ended six weeks after it began. The Spanish war is a bad war, and nobody is right. All I care about is human beings and alleviating their suffering. It's none of my business, and I'm not making it mine, but my sympathies are always for exploited working people against absentee landlords. Even if I drink around with the landlords and shoot pigeons with them, I would as soon shoot them as the pigeons. Ernesto did not come here as a warrior, staring up the people to sack Madrid, which they were saying in the press. He had come here in 1937 to be a hero, at a time when his creative energies were at a low point. And he did not come here empty-handed. He had more than $40,000 of his own money to equip a fleet of ambulances. His role was partly strategist, partly missionary, a military advice no one listened to. And above everything, a compassionate comrade sharing a humiliating defeat. The sad thing, the reason it is very hard for me to talk about Ernesto, is that in this country, people talk about the man, the image of the man, and not about his art, which is writing, for whom the bell tolls was for years condemned here, not as a novel, but as fake journalism, the work of a naive reporter. I believe in the people and their right to govern themselves as they wish. But you mustn't believe in killing, he told himself. You must do it as a necessity, but you must not believe in it. But how many people do you suppose you have killed? I won't keep account of people I have killed as though it were a trophy record or a disgusting business like notches in a gun, he told himself. I have a right to not keep count, and I have a right to forget them. The first time I met Hemingway, I was a young boy. And there was a group of us playing baseball in front of the finca. A big black car rolled up and two men got out. It was a very tall, strong man wearing sandals. 
And he was trying to open the gate. So we ran up to them and we opened the gate for them. The tall man asked, where's your baseball team? And he laughed when we showed him the ball made of rags and the bat made of a broom handle. And then he asked, why don't we play inside on the other side of the fence? And we said, no, no, we can't do that. The gardener will chase us with his machete. He said, if I buy here, you'll be allowed to play baseball inside the property. Right there, we're going to have a baseball field. I have sons Gigi and Patrick, and we'll form a team. We were so happy. He ordered equipment, gloves, balls, bats, all the equipment necessary for two baseball teams. Luis, my twin brother, played right field and I played left. We were both very bad. I see the ball and run forward. And then it sails over my head. We barely knew how to play baseball. And he was teaching us. We called him Papa. Thirteen kids saying, Papa, Papa. He was very happy. Hemingway had split up with his second wife, Pauline, and traveled to Cuba with Martha Gellhorn, his third wife. And she was the one that discovered La Finca Vigía. He could have chosen to live in Spain. He didn't. He could have chosen Paris. He didn't. He could have chosen to live in New York. He didn't either. This was the place he needed. Was his first home, his first house he bought with his money. And all he needed to write, to create, to love, to live, was here at La Finca Vigía. People ask you why you live in Cuba. And you say it is because you like it. It's too complicated to explain about the early morning in the hills above Havana, where every morning is cool and fresh. You do not tell them about all the migratory birds that come through nor the quail come in the early morning to drink at the swimming pool. You do not try to explain about our ball team, hardball, not softball, where if you're over 40, you can have a boy run for you and still stay in the game. Confidential, April 27, 1943, from Special Agent D.M. Ladd to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. At the present time, Hemingway is alleged to be performing a highly secret naval operation for the Navy Department. Navy Department said to be paying the expenses for Hemingway's boat, furnishing him with arms, and charting courses in the Cuban area. December 17, 1942, from J. Edgar Hoover to Special Agent Gordon Letty, Havana, Cuba. Any information you may have relating to the unreliability of Ernest Hemingway as an informant may be From Special Agent D.M. Ladd to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, Mr. Hemingway was active in aiding the Loyalist cause in Spain. His actions have indicated that his views are liberal and that he may be inclined toward communist political philosophy. From FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover to Agents Tam and Ladd. Hemingway is the last man, in my estimation, to be used in any such capacity. The Germans were sinking American tankers one after the other off the East Coast, and they sank a fantastic amount of tonnage. I used to go up at the roof and, and see them. You could see the sky lit up with these things. It was terrible. That's what that's where this operation started. 
The plan was to cruise off the coast, hoping to be ordered alongside by a German submarine. The Pilar was heavily armed with machine guns, a bazooka, and high explosives. Ernest and his crew of nine would use the weapons to destroy the submarine. Ernest's wife, Martha, thought his exploits were just an excuse to fish and get extra gasoline in wartime. From FBI agent Letty to FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, this writer has been advised in confidence by an embassy official that Hemingway's organization was disbanded and its work terminated as of April 1, 1943. My aim at this moment was to get into Paris without being shot. Our necks had been out for a long time. Paris was going to be taken. Ahead on our left, a German ammunition dump was burning, and the very colored anti-aircraft projectiles were bursting in the continuous rattle and pop of exploding 20 millimeter. I couldn't locate Archie Pelkey, but I found him later. He had advanced on the burning munitions dump. Don't go off by yourself, I said. Archie, who has bright red hair, six years of regular army, four words of French, a missing front tooth, was laughing heartily. Sure is popping off, Papa, he shouted. They say this Paris is quite a town, Papa. You ever been into it? Yeah. I couldn't say anything more just then, because I had a funny choke in my throat. And I had to clean my glasses, because there now, below us, gray and always beautiful, was spread the city I loved best in all the world. Dear Mousy, it has been about two months since Papa came back to France after landing on D-Day on Omaha Beach. Suppose you saw that piece in Collier's. It is a lovely story, and we need never have any long, dull winter evenings until you all get sick of hearing it. Mouse, I miss you and the old man Gigi and Bumby all the time, and think about our fine times to come. When I was in such bloody awful shape in London, Kappa's girl was awfully good to me. And so was another fine girl named Mary Welsh. Think you would like. Dear Wallace, with this letter I am sending you an uncorrected typescript of The Old Man in the Sea. I know that it is the best I can write ever for all of my life, I think, and that it destroys good and able work by being placed alongside of it. Tactically, publishing it now will get rid of the school of criticism that I am through as a writer. Good luck, Wallace. I hope I am bringing you a victory. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. In the first 40 days, a boy had been with him. But after 40 days without a fish, the boy's parents had told him that the old man was now definitely and finally Salau, which is the worst form of unlucky. It made the boy sad to see the old man come in each day with his skiff empty, and he always went down to help him carry either the coiled lines or the gaff and harpoon and the sail that was furled around the mast. The sail was patched with flour sacks, and furled, it looked like the flag of permanent defeat. The old man in the sea is different from other works by Hemingway. The main character is always a reflection of his personality, but Santiago is different. He's not a young man taking on the world, he's an old man with wrinkles and eyes as blue as the sea. He's a man of experience trying to make a comeback, fighting to stay alive. Good luck, old man. Good luck, the old man said. There were other boats from the other beaches going out to sea, 
And the old man heard the dip and push of their oars, even though he could not see them now the moon was below the hills. They spread apart after they were out of the mouth of the harbor, and each one headed for the part of the ocean where he hoped to find fish. The old man knew he was going far out, and he left the smell of the land behind and rowed out into the clean early morning smell of the ocean. Dear Charlie, after a book, I'm emotionally exhausted. If you are not, you have not transferred the emotion completely to the reader. Anyway, that's the way it works with me. This next fortnight is the really big fish of the year. When the barometer falls, the fish go deep. When the fishing is over, I want to get away, badly. Too much interference and work. And I rate a vacation. When he crashed in Africa, he crashed twice, as a matter of fact, obituaries appeared all over the world. And he was having a roaring good time reading all these obituaries. But I think that second air crash contributed to his ultimate depression about himself. He really was badly hurt. Although that was sort of the, the hero thing. All of his heroes got hurt. All of his heroes got beat up. All of his heroes, in the end, had to meet a, a less than dramatic ending. Well, Hemingway lived the life heroic, but it was an extraordinarily vulnerable man who was living that life. No writer who knows the great writers who did not receive the prize can accept it other than with humility. It would be impossible for me to ask the ambassador of my country to read a speech in which a writer said all of the things which are in his heart. Writing at its best is a lonely life. A writer grows in public stature as he sheds his loneliness and often his work deteriorates. For he does his work alone and if he is a good enough writer, he must face eternity or the lack of it each day. It is because we have had such great writers in the past that a writer is driven far out past where he can go, out to where no one can help him. Cuba is really bad now, Mouse. I am not a big fear, danger pussy. But living in a country where no one is right, both sides atrocious, I am fed on it. We are always treated okay, as in all countries, and have fine, good friends. But things aren't good. to life. There was writing and swimming and then eating and drinking and each night different people came to dinner. One Thursday night Bill Bonsall who was the American ambassador came and he started suggesting to Ernest that things were really going very poorly between the State Department and Cuba and that Ernest should definitely think about leaving, leaving before uh, it was too late. And Ernest just sort of brushed it aside. He said, oh, I've been in Cuba through I don't know how many regimes. We've had upheavals. He said, I'm not a political person. I'm a writer. But it was within a month that Phil came back and he said, this is the last Thursday I'm going to be able to come because I've been recalled. And he said, Ernest, you are a high-profile person in Cuba. And in Washington, the word traitor had come up. 
So Ernest had to really seriously reconsider whether he could continue staying in Cuba. one morning he hadn't slept and he said did you hear the planes last night and I said I didn't hear anything and he said yeah th there were American planes burning the sugarcane fields so you know now it, it wasn't just talk it was actions as well and he became very concerned about that this sort of deep fear and anxiety started building up and he began to have difficulty with the writing. It wasn't that he couldn't write, but it was that he was writing too much and he seemed to have lost that unerring facility he had all his life for cutting things down. Now he just couldn't decide what to cut out and everything seemed important. But at that point, none of us actually realized that there was something wrong with Ernest. We just didn't. When we left the Finca Vigia, it was, I think, probably the hardest thing Ernest ever did in his life. The Finca was his home. It held all that was dear to him. His papers were there, his books, his animals. Leaving and knowing that in all likelihood he would never come back there. It was devastating for him. It's easy to understand why Ernest chose Ketchum. It looked like Africa, it looked like Spain. It's kind of barren. But not only physically was it the right kind of terrain for him, the people were the right kind of people for him. Everybody hunted there and everybody was into birds and animals and that's what he liked. It was a real uh, task to beat that guy at uh, shooting a hand trap. And he'd, 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 he'd compliment you but he could see the look in his eye that he was going to beat you on the next round. But none of us knew about any r real psychological trouble. The doctor here kept a real secret on it. Of course, it bothered him, you know, to have to leave Cuba. And I think it finally had a real effect on him. He looked old after 1958, I thought. He wasn't as exuberant as he was before. He was just a little bit uh, spooky. That's the word he would use, spooky. I was at work one day at the hospital, and Dr. Sabers came to me and said that Mr. Hemingway wanted to go to his house to get some things before he went to Rochester, Minnesota, to the Mayo Clinic, and that I was to go with him and Don. I drove up to the hospital and picked up Papa and Joan, and we drove back to the house. We parked right behind the kitchen door, and Mr. Hemingway got out of the car quickly. He was very quiet, didn't, didn't say a word, just darted into the house. I was in the hall area when I heard Don call out. He had gotten over to the gun rack and had the shells in the gun. I was in the process of shooting himself, there's no doubt about it. So I grabbed him from behind and Joni came in behind me. Don and Mr. Hemingway were struggling. Don was behind Mr. Hemingway with his arms around him, holding him. And Mr. Hemingway had a double barrel shotgun in his hand. We got the gun loose, and then after that, he just slumped down and, and uh, just didn't say anything. Mary was upstairs, and she came down. She was very gentle with him and consoling. I don't think Ernest wrote anymore after he went to the Mayo Clinic that last time. I think that was the farewell. I'm sure he wanted to write more, but nothing moved the pencil. It's as if this remarkable force, this remarkable portion of genius that had been allotted to him, that he had in his bank, they had withdrawn it all, and the bank was empty and he was not able to fuel anything anymore. He was really emptied. You see, he felt more than almost anyone I've ever met. 
be like when he was happy, he was so happy. When he was angry, he was so angry. I mean, all his emotions were just super hyper emotions. And so when he was despairing, he was really, you know, desperate. He lived on his own terms. Nobody ever told her what to do, what to write, what to say, what to think. And nobody was going to tell him how to die. There must be moments when we see right through, although we say we can't. I knew a fisher who could lean and look blind into dazzle on the sea and strike into that fire with his hook far under and lean back and laugh and let the line run out and reel what rod could weigh nor line could feel, the heavy silver of his wish. And when the real spool faltered, kneel, and with a fumbling hand that shook, boat, all bloody from the gaff, a shivering fish. <laughs> <laughs> 